I'm Xavier Ducroy. Uh, I work on the Developer Tools team. Uh, hi, my name is Armas, and I am from Android Toolkit team. Uh, seems like everyone is very awake, which is great. Thanks for, for the attention you guys are giving us. Uh, anyway, so we're going to be talking about building bigger, better uh, from the perspective of the big uh, Gradle project, Android X, and as well as Android Studio. Uh, we're here to hopefully dispel the myth that you cannot build big projects with Gradle. Uh, so every project starts simple. Uh, but quickly, over, as you add more and more features, it gets really complicated. And through my work on Chrome for Android uh, and Android X, formerly known as Sabor Library, I learned that Android projects are just the same. Uh, they start as big monolithic projects. They grow over time. And each incremental change makes sense. Uh, for some context, over the past six years, uh, Android X grew from 5 to 240 Gradle projects. Uh, we went from 90,000 lines of code to over 400,000. Uh, we have an order of magnitude more commits, writing all the cool libraries for you guys, like uh, Jetpack Compose and others. Uh, but as you can imagine, the initial Gradle config just couldn't keep up with this. It was like not good enough of a setup. So in this talk, we will focus on how we made it better and how we improved. Uh, so let me state the obvious. Uh, when it comes to builds, modularization is good. You first of all get more parallelism, so you are able to compile multiple projects at the same time. You also get more compilation avoidance because Gradle is able to skip certain libraries in cases. Uh, for your fetches, you're often invalidating fewer projects, so you get more, uh, fewer cache uh, invalidations. Uh, additionally, you avoid tangled dependencies that you get from monolithic builds. Uh, we definitely struggled with that in Android X for libraries like v4. We, we added a dozens of classes, and there was dependencies, circular, circular dependencies, but it made it almost impossible to pull those libraries apart into smaller pieces. Uh, and finally, uh, you get to test your libraries easier, because now your libraries live with tests next to them. So you exactly know what to test uh, when you uh, make a change. Uh, in architecture components, for example, we found that creating pure Java libraries as a common layer between other libraries was really helpful. Uh, first of all, you get the separation from Android APIs, which lets you run those tests on a host, uh, which is really fast. It's not running on the phone. Uh, additionally, you get faster builds, because uh, by definition, these Android, uh, non-Android uh, Java and Kotlin uh, projects are a lot lighter. Uh, they don't handle uh, variants. Uh, they don't have uh, Android resources. They don't have manifests and so on. Uh, so for your project, if you can pull out these kind of projects, I would highly recommend starting with making them pure Kotlin or Java. Um, Gradle plug plugins can be great, uh, but overusing them can cause you issues and wasted work. Uh, for example, if you have a Gradle plugin for publishing to Maven, uh, you really should be applying it to the project that needs uh, to publish to Maven. Otherwise, you're creating all these tasks, and you will be wasting time. Uh, so modularization here helps you to apply these kind of uh, plugins to a much smaller scope, so you're applying it to a smaller project that you know, leads to faster builds. Uh, similarly to the plugins, annotation processors can waste time, especially in a non-incremental type. Uh, so for example, if you use Android X Room Library, uh, you should really pull the libraries that need room into a separate project and run the annotation processor just on that project. Uh, that way, you isolate on what the annotation processor runs, thus increasing your speed. Uh, if your project is an application, uh, you should really consider running Lint only in the final project. Uh, because Android, while Lint is while it's amazing at finding bugs, as you do modularization, you're going to be running it on more and more projects, slowing it down. Uh, however, I want to note, if you do ship libraries, I would highly recommend continuing to run Lint on those libraries, because things like minimum SDK affect how Lint runs, uh, and it will return different results and help you catch bugs. Uh, we introduced the concept of API and implementation over two years ago. Uh, it allows you to uh, specify your dependencies uh, as implementation details, which essentially helps with the compilation avoidance that I mentioned before. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, there's a recording from uh, from yesterday but Zav, uh, of the talk that Zav did. Um, so it's not all great. Uh, there are some downsides of doing the breakdown. And one of the obvious ones is you have a, a, larger, uh, a larger dependency graph. So Gradle has to load up uh, more build files and figure out what's going on and what the dependencies are. But often these uh, are offset uh, by the fact that you're doing a lot of saving from all the things that I described before. Uh, one thing that is not so easy and not so obvious is that you have a lot more uh, build files now. And this is one of the things that we struggled a lot in, in Android X. Uh, so 
A standard practice for, uh, in software engineering is not to repeat yourself. And, and the same applies to build configuration files. Uh, less, less code is simply easier to manage. Uh, in Android X, for example, if you wanted to bump to a new version of Espresso, that meant touching 100 build.gradle files and doing the same manual change every place. And it was really error prone. It was really easy to make a mistake. Uh, so these kind of explicit versions made it e difficult to upgrade and also was unclear of what versions are used across the project. Uh, so one option to kind of get around that is to use Gradle's extra uh, stash. So it allows you to put strings on this object, uh, and then you set it up in your uh, root build.gradle file. Uh, then to utilize them, you can put it in each project's build.gradle uh, file and then use it there. This solves the centralization problem and makes it really easy to update. So instead of having to touch hundreds of files, you touch it in one place, and now you have updated version across throughout your project. It can be further extended to use this kind of extra property for other things as well. Uh, so in Android X, we used this a lot, and it was very helpful. But sadly, you do not get things like autocomplete, and you do not get to click through and see what version you actually are setting. So to get around that, there is a way. Uh, so Gradle offers you an implicit build uh, that gets automatically added to the build class path. All you need to do is to create a build source directory and add build.gradle in there, and that project will automatically get built before your real project, and it will get added to your build class path. So solving the same dependencies pr uh, problem, uh, you can create a uh, Kotlin file in build source. And just like in step one, you have the same thing, but now you're setting, writing it all in Kotlin. And then similarly, you also refer to it in your build.gradle files. Uh, we eventually moved to this style uh, to specify all of our dependencies in Android X. Uh, it gives you the same centralization benefits. Uh, you also get autocomplete and you get to click through to see uh, the versions that you're actually using. Uh, so in Android X, we found that there's way more configuration that we found the same from build file to build file to build file. And a lot of these were coming from uh, Android Gradle plugin and the Gradle the Android DSL. Uh, so using ex extra property like we did in the beginning did not quite scale, uh, because you cannot th create things like flavors and stuff very easily at the root. Um, so Gradle handles configuration via plugins most of the time. And you can create one of your own in build source. Uh, in, Android X, in Android X, we created one of them to set the common properties that were common across all the projects. Um, in, in, in this slide, the important part is to override the apply method. That's the one that gets called when you apply the plugin. Uh, and when you uh, are applied, you can react when other plugins are added. So for example, if Android Gradle plugin is added, you can react to it, and then you can take the extension, which is essentially the backing store uh, that you can use in uh, build.gradle files behind the Android DSL, uh, and you can set things up. So one thing to note here, uh, you can have one custom plugin that you wrote, write that handles many, many external plugins. You don't need to write one for each plugin. Uh, so in this example, this handles both Android library plugin and Android application plugin. Uh, and then as they get up, you just get automatically set up. Uh, so here, you have the same power as you had in the Android uh, DSL in your build.gradle. You can set things like target SDK. You can set the default test runner, enable coverage, and so on. The two extensions that you really care about are library extension from the library plugin and app extension from the application plugin. Uh, same is true for other plugins. So for example, if you have a Java library, uh, you can also configure it in the same way. Uh, the only difference here is that you have to use a convention instead of an extension. Uh, it's very similar otherwise. Um, so when you have this setup, it's super easy to apply. And creating a new module becomes trivial. All your developers have to do is throw in a few lines of code, and, and, you're, and you're pretty much set. So in Android X specifically, we achieved huge gains of this. We went to over, uh, from over 150 lines of code per build.gradle per project to around 35 lines of code per build.gradle. And considering we have 240 projects, that's a huge savings. Uh, so in our plugin, we set up things like uh, Maven configuration for uploading. Uh, we set up Javadoc builds uh, and, and Lint uh, and other uniform properties. Sadly, we hit an issue where if you want to do a custom configuration just to one library, for example, if one of your libraries has a different minimum SDK version, uh, the setup didn't really allow for that. So we needed to find a way to accommodate for this kind of change. Uh, so the first option is just to set those custom values in each library build.gradle file. Uh, in this example, we're setting a different minimum SDK and different target Java version. 
Uh, and in Android X, we did exactly that. So this is a real example from lifecycle uh, runtime build our Gradle. Uh, we simply apply Android X plugin, uh, Android library plugin. We set up the dependencies and just add some options for uh, Android DSL that are specific to this library. Like this library actually has ProGuard configs that we want to ship inside of the AAR. Uh, one difference here is we also created our own DSL that allows us to tweak how our own plugin works. So when our plugin sets everything up, it reads these values, and then we're able to specify how our uh, Maven publishing works. So isn't it great to see all of the configuration for one real production library in two slides? I sure think so. Uh, and Zav is going to talk about of how to set up this custom Gradle DSL. Thank you. So let's say you want to configure your own extension for your own plugin, right? Let's say uh, Let's take a very simple uh, example here. You have your own plugin, and you just want to have my config with one property in it. So here, I want SuperSlit warning to be a Boolean. Uh, notice that there's no, uh, you know, I'm using a setter here, and, and we're going to see why in a second. So the first thing that you need to do is to create an extension class. And this extension class is very basic. Uh, it doesn't need to extend anything. And uh, so here, I have it, and I have my property. So notice two things. The first one, I'm not declaring a Boolean type. Uh, I'm not using a Boolean type. I'm using a property Boolean. That is a new API in Gradle that they introduced maybe about a year ago. Um, and the second thing that you can notice here is that I'm declaring both the, uh, the class and the property as abstract. So those property objects have to be instantiated in a very special way. Uh, and in order to do that manually, you have to inject a factory into your class. And it's really a lot of boilerplate that you don't want to do. So starting, be, uh, I think, two uh, versions of Gradle ago, if you declare your classes as abstract, um, Gradle is going to take care of it. Because anyway, what Gradle does is that it never uses your type directly. It always extends your type and created a decorated version of it. And so here, when it creates that new type, it's going to take care of instantiating all the property, uh, uh, properties of type property something. So the way you instantiate it, uh, is just this way. You call project extension create. Uh, Orimas's example had a project extension get by type. So here we create it. The string is called my config. This is what will show up on your DSL, and you provide the type. The instance that that method return is not exactly my plugin extension. It's going to be the decorated version, but you don't have to care. You can just keep manipulating your own task. All the things that's added on top of it, you don't really have to worry about it. So now you want to use that. You want to use that value that you set in the uh, DSL into a task as an input. And so here, I'm creating a task. And I have a property. And I'm also setting the type of the property to be property of Boolean. Uh, this is very important. I'm also declaring it as abstract. And uh, the task also type, instead of being just a regular open type that you would do, I'm declaring it as abstract so that Gradle can decorate it and do the right thing for me. Next, I want to actually register my task using the lazy API. So register and a callback. That's a lambda that gets called whenever your task gets configured. And here, I'm setting onto my task property the property coming from my uh, extension. I'm not setting the value. I'm not doing my config.superslitwarning.get. If you do that, you lose some of the benefit. And so um, by using the property directly, you're basically doing a lazy binding between the two. So what happens is that this code here, the register, really is likely to happen in your apply. And your apply is at the very top of your build.grader. So if you change the value later, it's important that you do not set the value in the apply, because then if you change the value later, then the task will have the old value. So by using properties, you guarantee that whenever you're actually configuring your task or whenever you're setting the last value in the DSL, at the end, your task will have the latest value anyway. So this is a new uh, feature of Gradle, and it's really efficient, and should really use property everywhere. OK, let's look at other tips to really configure your project in the most efficient way possible. So when we talk about configuration, um, you know, the first advice that I have is really do as little as possible. I see a lot of people who do a lot of things in their build. They have 150 lines in their build at Gradle, and they do crazy things in there. And this is a cost you're going to pay, right? Every time you call into Gradle, whether you're syncing, doing a build, querying for the list of tasks, you're going to pay that cost. So it's important that you do as little as possible. Another advice is try to you know, see what you can do uh, 
that in release but not do it in debug, right? You have those build types by default. Uh, we see a lot of people doing way too much in debug that they don't need to do. Don't do it. And in, on CI, make sure that you only build whatever you actually need. We see people calling assemble, and that builds way more than they need. Um, so around configuration of tasks, you know, I just showed you the task.register. And uh, it's particularly important to use the lazy API, uh, because in Android, by default, you have five variants right, for each module. You have debug, release, and then three test variants. So it creates a lot of tasks. Uh, here in the example that I have, 100 module, it's 19,000 tasks. You don't want to create and configure all of them. Um, so we're already doing that. What's important for you is two things. First, when you create your own task, create them lazily. And second, when you use APIs from Gradle or from the Android plugin, use the proper API. Right? There's a lot of legacy API that returns a task instance, and we have them in AGP. Like you know, on your variant, you can do get compile that returns a compile task. If you use that, it's going to create them. It's going to force configure it. Um, Gradle has new API that returns a task provider, and we have new APIs return you know get compile provider that returns a task provider that's a lazy object. So you should use that. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is task wiring. Right? Um, if you're creating a lot of custom tasks, you probably have to do some depends on, uh, and that's very fragile, and really you shouldn't do it. Let's say you have A depends on B, and then later you change A to actually depend on C. If you don't pay attention, you may depend on B and C, and that's not what you want. So the only way of doing this is you, know, you have two tasks, one to generate an output directory, right, and the type of the property is file, and a task two that consumes that directory, and it has a property of type file as well. And so the way you configure those two tasks is on the first one, you do register, output, my location. On the second one, you do input dir equal. OK, so normally, in, uh, before, right, if, it, if you didn't have lazy configuration, you could do task one dot output dir, right? You just link those two locations directly. You can't really do that in lazy configuration. So you have to kind of either duplicate it or use another class that you know, centralizes all your location computation which is something we used to do in a GP a long time ago. And then you do a manual depends on, right? So the first thing is not great, and the second one is definitely terrible. You should not do that. You might be thinking, well, it's just the next line, so if I update the, location, the, the value of input D, I, I will remember to change the depends on, but the reality is that it's more likely to be somewhere else. Uh, at least in the Gradle plugin, it was definitely in a lot of somewhere else. Uh, and so we moved away from all of that. So Gradle in the last year, after they introduced the property type, they really improved a lot that. Uh, so let's see what it looks like and what's the best practice today. Uh, first, your task one, you're going to change it, and the property is not going to be directory property. Uh, and also, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm using also directory property on the second one. And of course, I use the abstract way so that Gradle takes care of instantiating all of those objects for me. So directory property is very interesting. It's, it's actually a property of directory, similar to property bool that I showed earlier. So it's you know, dynamic and lazy in the same way that the other one is. But it also includes task dependency information. Even though when you look at the type hierarchy, it doesn't really show anything. But the Java doc says, hey, it includes task dependency information. Uh, so let's see how I'm going to use that. Oh, and by the way, you see that it's actually a directory. There is a matching regular file property, so your API is uh, more precise. And you cannot link two tasks, one that generates a directory, the other one that reads a file anymore, because it's, it's type safe there. So setting up task one, uh, it's very similar. I would put here set and then the value. Uh, so no difference there. On the task two, what I'm doing is the same way I did with the task and the extension earlier, where I'm setting on one property the other property directly to make a link between them. I want to do that too. But here, because I have a lazy task, well, the the obvious easy way or lazy way to do it is to say, well, task one.get, and then I get the property. Uh, well, it's not lazy at all, actually, because it's going to force configure your task, which is not something you want to do. So task one and task two are type of type task provider, and they have this thing called flat map. So what flat map does, it returns a provider of a directory, provider being um, the uh, parent type of property, and it's a read-only uh, type. And so this is lazy. It's going to encapsulate the property of task one. And it's going to propagate the value in a lazy way, but it's also going to propagate the dependency uh, lazily. And so now, input here automatically depends on task one. Uh, sorry, task two directly depends on task one. 
I don't have to do anything. If I change input dir to be set to a different value, then it will automatically change my dependency. So when you extract flat map into an artifact, a value, that's very interesting, because this thing now represents the artifact and whatever's needed to build it. And you don't have to care about the how, which is you know, keeping track of task one. So imagine you have a task that output two things, and you have some code that use those two things. And then later, you change that task to actually be two tasks, each that generate one thing. If you're already using the provider of directory or provider of regular file, you don't have to care. You don't have to keep track of the task. You just keep track of this artifact, and then you just read it. It doesn't matter who created it, and it's updated. Uh, this is something that's very powerful, and that makes code much cleaner. Uh, this is something that internally in, in the Gradle plugin we're moving toward. And that I think it will have, we'll expose that as a public API at some point. OK, so uh, in my previous talk yesterday, we talked about worker API. Jerome talked about it, explained how things are less efficient if you have tasks that are not using worker and tasks that are using worker. So please go look at the talk. And, and the message for you today is if you have custom tasks, please use the worker API. Uh, look at the API online on the Gradle site. It's not that difficult. And uh, you should really do it. Another thing that I want to mention is you know, when you create tasks, always create a custom type. It may th seem like easier to use some of the API shortcut that Gradle has. Like you could do something like that. It's like, hey, I have a task, and I'm just configuring it and saying, here, do this thing. It looks OK, right? You know, and there's some trick between the Groovy DSL and the KTS DSL. You know, and you might be thinking that it does the right thing. But if you were to actually use a uh, default type from Gradle and try to extend it, you would realize that actually you know, you're doing expensive call, whatever it is directly in the configuration. So every time you build, you're actually going to do what your task is supposed to do. This is not good, right? So the real shortcut would now be task do last expensive. And so it doesn't look as well anyway. And then do last cannot use workers. Uh, you can't really declare inputs or outputs. And so the best practice is always you know, create your own type, declare input, declare outputs, and use workers. Uh, if you don't do it, you're basically not building as efficiently as you should. Um, now, talking about doing things during configuration that you shouldn't do, uh, really, you know, we see a lot of people trying to do like, a lot of computation, and it's really not something that you should be doing. Now, I realize that we don't have awesome APIs to let you do some of the things that you want to do, but I'm going to run you through two examples that kind of explain uh, some workarounds to do a better job. So the first one that is by far the one that we see most people do is putting Git information into their version code or version name. Uh, so we see something like that. Version code equal, and then call into Git and get the head shawan or whatever. And it's just not efficient at all. Again, you're going to do that every time you sync, every time you call Gradle just to do, you know, like, hey, what's the list of tasks or what's my dependencies? It's just not efficient. So as I said, we don't really have a better way to do it, or a nice way, but there are some ways to do it. So the answer should always be, I need to do it in a task. So here, because it's not very easy. The, the way that I found is, well, the version code is injected in the manifest merger. So if at the end of the manifest merger I go and I inject the version, it should work. So the solution looks like this. I'm going to run you through it. So the first thing is that you're going to have to um, read the version code and, um, and put it in. The, uh, you're going to read, you have to read the, the manifest file. And so since I'm a little bit lazy and I don't want to use a full XML library and find the attributes, I'm just going to do a search and replace. So I said version code to a lot of nines. Hopefully, it's not a string that is present multiple times in my file. Uh, the next thing is I need to loop over all of my variants. right? You always have to deal. If you deal with tasks, you have multiple variants. You have to deal with them. Uh, and then well, so the manifest merger is part of the, manif uh, the output because of multi-APK, if you use splits and things like that. Here, I don't have any, so I'm just going to loop on them, but I know I only have one. And then I use. Oops, sorry. I use manifest merger provider, right? Remember earlier I said don't use the non-provider version. So here I get manifest provider, return a task provider, and I can call configure, which just register a lambda to run whenever the task is configured later. So it's lazy. So inside I add a do last. So you know I said earlier workers, but I, that's the only solution I have right now. And then inside it's very easy, right? The first thing I do is I read the manifest. So here the Manifest merger actually has a property, which is a directory property, manifest output directory. So it's a get and then as file. 
And then I just read the file, I do a search and replace, and I write it back. And if you do that, it will actually work. Now, there are some things that you need to tweak a little bit, right? Like if you do a git commit touching, let's say, a readme file, your git sha1 has changed, your, your head sha1 has changed, but your code hasn't, so you need to technically recompile. Uh, caching also is important to use the input, so you need to do a little bit more work. Uh, and so on, greater, on tasks, you can create new inputs. Uh, so here I declare a new input. The name has to be unique. I put something random here. Uh, and then you pass the value. And again, it has to be lazy, so don't put the actual value. Put a callable that will do the value so that Gradle can call that whenever you need that. Uh, the last thing here is that, well, I end up calling compute value twice uh, inside and during input validation. So you technically should extract that into a callable, memoize it somehow. Um, and in fact, I should probably put that one above my application loop because I need to, um, I don't want to do that for both debug and release. Some caveats here, um, you know, the, the model is not up to date. So if you have another plugin that uses version code, it's not going to get the value. Um, val here I use a value as an input. Generally, you want to use a file. But the input here should be the git index, which can be really big. So do I want to do a checksum of all of it? Maybe using jgit, I can get the value faster. So up to you. Figure it out. Uh, and then don't, last, do last, uh, don't use worker. In fact, uh, you know, they don't use worker, and they, they don't work very well with worker, right? So if you have your task here and you add a worker at the end, um, if the task uses a worker, the do last doesn't, that means that if another task runs at the same time, it can move do last actually and schedule it a bit later. So if you look at Gradle scans, the, the time of the execution of the, the, the uh, task might be bigger than it seems, but it, but it is because of that white space in the middle. Something to think about. Um, OK, so we have another example, which is you know, we see people passing data via build config. Uh, for example, they compute a value and they put it there. So here it's harder to hook into the end and actually you know, add to the class. So you can generate your own class. So in order to do that, it's very easy. You create a task, uh, so some input, package name, class name, location, and then the value. Um, and then I mean, the generation is relatively easy. Right? I'm just generating a four-line Java class. So it's not, uh, nothing to talk about. Uh, the part about that we want to look at is how I register it, right? So again, I loop on the variants. I create my task with a unique name using the variant name. And then I set the value here, again, using something lazy. So provider, uh, project that provider you know, receives a callable and return a provider object, basically, so that it's lazy and it's going to work out of the box. L the last thing you need to do is you need to, set, uh, you need to tell us that, hey, I have generated some Java code. Please go and compile it. I'll pass it to Studio so that I don't have unresolved symbols. And sadly, your API to do that receives task and not task provider. So we need to update that to make that lazy task uh, compatible. So you would have to actually go and call on your task provider to get, which will configure it right away, which is not great. But it's better than doing the computation during, um, uh, during the configuration. All right. Cool. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit through the guide to investigations of how do you want to go about profiling, measuring, and optimizing your builds. Uh, so build scans is a really great tool that is provided by Gradle, uh, the company behind Gradle. Uh, it's really simple to use. You run the same tasks you normally do. You just simply add dash dash scan at the end, uh, that will, and it will prompt you to accept the license, and then it will upload your results for uh, analysis. The important caveat to note here, this does send the data to Gradle servers, uh, so you should be comfortable with doing that. They do give you an option to delete all the results uh, after you're done uh, anal your analysis, but you should just be aware of them when you're doing this. Uh, so the reason why this tool is really helpful, it helps you find those non-lazy tasks that uh, Zav was talking about. And as well, you can find where your dependencies that get resolved during the configuration time, which is another big no-no. Uh, so in yesterday's talk, if you saw, Zav was talking about the 100 module uh, like baseline build, right? And then this is how it compares to Android X. Uh, so this is a real project that has 240 modules and is able to configure it in 24 milliseconds per project. So if you're seeing your builds with you know, 40, five, you know, 50 modules taking 10 seconds, 20 seconds, there's definitely ways to improve and make it better. Uh, so all I'm saying is get inspired, right? So this is only six milliseconds worse than a baseline project. And one thing to note here that you can see in the slides that we're not even doing that many lazy task configurations. That just means we haven't done the work to actually make it as fast as it can be. 
So in Android X, we actually used build scans in another way. We used it to investigate uh, the effects of JVM max memory limits. Uh, we wanted to see how does that affect uh, our um, project, right? And for our project, it turned out to be the biggest bang for the buck, potentially. Uh, new Studio projects start with one and a half gig uh, limit for your uh, Gradle JVM. And that might not be enough for your project. So what you want to do is you really want to run an experiment where you try the different values and see how that uh, comes out in terms of to get the optimal value of speed versus memory usage. Uh, the things you want to do, you want to run the dash dash rerun tasks that forces you to run all the tasks. Uh, otherwise, you might be skipping some tasks due to caching and stuff like that, and that will give you incorrect results. Uh, you want to kill demons in between the runs, because if you don't, uh, the Gradle uh, daemon will stay, stick around and cause you memory pressure, also leading to incorrect results. Uh, another thing to run is you want to run tasks that are common to your developer. So if your developer does assemble debug all the time, that's the path you should optimize for. And then finally, and probably more importantly, is you want to run it on a typical developer machine. If you're going to test it out on a beefy machine and then the developer is going to run it on a different one, you're not going to have the same performance characteristics. Uh, so as you play around with JVM memory limit, you just want to use build scans and see how the execution time and garbage collection time, uh, uh, what the ratio is. So here in Android X, we did a scan, and it takes five minutes to GC and a total build of nine minutes. That means we're only doing like four minutes of valuable work, and the rest of it is just garbage collecting. And that's bad. That's where the state we were in before we started investigating. There's obviously like hard limits of how small the memory can be. If you try to build Android X with one gig of memory allowed, after 14 minutes of struggling, it will just throw out a memory exception. Uh, so as we did the test, you can see in the graph, one and two gigs were simply just not a thing that you can do. And at four gigs, we're wasting a lot of time garbage collecting. Uh, we ended up picking number eight gigabytes for us, because that was the best in terms of what the developer machines we had available and the speed we were able to achieve. As you can see, there's diminishing returns. As you give Gradle more memory, there will be less garbage collection, but there's only, you should really pick a value. Uh, and note, don't just take eight gigabytes and set it in your project. This is for our project. You should do your own experiment and kind of run it yourself. Um, Another lever you have to pull is number, uh, Gradle workers. So Gradle, by default, gives you the number of workers as you have processors. Uh, and that might be too many for you, because what happens is the more workers you spin up, the more memory is being used at the same time. And if you don't have enough memory, you force your computer to go into garbage collection all the time. So potentially, limiting the number of workers, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it might make your builds faster. And you essentially want to run the same process of experimentation that we did uh, for uh, max memory. Uh, and finally, one thing you want to notice, for your CI, you probably should be picking different values for the maximum JVM limits, as well for max workers. And the reasons are, your CI probably runs way more tasks in different tasks than what your build machines do. And then also, you probably have way beefier machines with more CPU and more RAM. And Zav is going to walk you through how to use a tracer agent to do more debugging. Thank you. OK, so um, yesterday I mentioned that you should really uh, profile your configuration, right? Especially if you apply a lot of plugin or if you have your own plugin. So um, of course, you can use any Java profiler. Uh, but we found that uh, you know, that was probably a better way, a more user-friendly way to profile that. So we created this little tool called Tracer Agent uh, that you can go and download from a repository. You can build it, look at the readme, see everything. But basically, it works two different ways, right? One way is you can create uh, some custom events you know, using the API. Or you can just you know, enable it, uh, attach it to your JVM. It's going to run inside it. And uh, you provide it with a list of things to instrument. Uh, and then at the end, it's going to output a uh, JSON file that you can just load in the Chrome tracing tool and see everything that happens. So I did that with the little plugin that I made for this demo about like the manifest merger, do last, and the little generate code for build config and things like that. Uh, so what I did here is I set it up to instrument everything in my custom package. Right? And then I added a couple of lines to instrument a few uh, methods from Gradle to see some life cycle between configuration and execution, and a few of our own methods in order to also instrument and see what's happening in the Gradle plugin. Um, so you load that into Chrome, uh, and then you see all the colors, and you're wondering what's happening. So if we dig into the configuration phase, you see the, the, green, the, the large green banner at the top is the whole configuration phase. Um, and then you can you know, zoom in, and you can see that this tiny little line here is the apply plugin 
of my own plugin, right? So I do very little here. Great. Uh, but then you can see that you have those two lines. And if I look at the name, it says custom plugin dot something. That's my code, too. In fact, it's whenever you do android.applicationvariant.all, you're just registering callback to happen later whenever the Gradle plugin create those variants and then call you back. So it doesn't show up in my uh, apply plugin. It shows up somewhere else. That's why this tool is great, because you say, show me where that method is you know, taking time, wherever it is. I don't have to go and backtrack it where it's coming from. So here, um, it's called twice. And it's the method called uh, you know, generate, uh, create generate code tasks. So that's my second example that I showed about. Um, and it's uh, taking a large amount of time compared to like, the whole pink line, which is create Android task. And it's just for one task, right? So uh, what happens here is I left a thread slip 100 millisecond so that it shows up there. But basically, you can go and really look to see where your code is. Uh, another example, this is during execution phase. And again, you, know, you don't really see anything else. Normally, it should be like a waterfall chart. But here, it only shows you basically the end. And it's my compute version code. Uh, so and I can see that it's called three times. So I mentioned, you know, so it turns out that the first two are actually Gradle doing up-to-date checks and calling the method to be like, hey, what's the current version compared to the old one? And then the third one is the execution. Right? And so you know, I mentioned during, earlier during my slide that you, know, you needed to memoize it. And here, obviously, I did not do it. And therefore, I see it run three times. And so that's very useful. So the good thing here is that you can basically instrument any plugin. Right? If you apply a bunch of plugins, go look at their source, you know, just open the jar, see what the package name is, just add the package name. It's going to instrument all the plugin. And then you can just run a regular build, look at JSON files, see where you're spending a lot of time, and figure out why your configuration is way above the baseline that you know, Orimas and I showed you. Right? And I, I've talked to people telling me I have a like, few dozen uh, modules, and I have 30 plus second configuration. And this is not normal. Right? You should be way faster than that. So I highly recommend that you use this tool or any other Java profiler to really figure out why you're spending so much time. And with that, thank you. Uh, we will be at the sandbox if you have questions. And uh, thank you for coming.